We have a full agenda of business this morning and I intend that we progress this uh, effectively. I'll take, I'll take the opportunity to remind everyone that meeting won't be recorded. Rona, could have the said an apology. Yeah, thank you, Leader. We have apologies from Councillor Carruthers, hey, Councillor Councillors Diggle, Dykes, Gilroy and Smith. And as we start the meeting, Councillor McGregor's not yet here. Okay, can we move on to item, sorry, uh, two is declarations of interest, members? No, no declarations. Item three, minute of the meeting of the 22nd November. This is up for approval. Uh, I'll approve. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, I'd just like to... Try, sorry, second it. I'm happy to second it, like, but I'd like to draw the committee's attention to <coughs> item 21 on that uh, minute. And the recommendation that we agreed at 21.4 was a late addition put before the committee, which hadn't been discussed by the Dumfries Common Goods Subcommittee. Um, the decision that was taken appeared to be a very simple one, but we've since discovered that what is actually envisaged may be different from what we understood when we took that decision. And I'm therefore asking this committee to agree that the implementation of the decision is halted to allow the Dumfries Common Goods Subcommittee time to consider the position and if necessary, to come back to this committee in March. Can we agree? Okay. Fine. Thanks for that. Sorry? Could, could I possibly please just have some advice on that? I mean, would we normally do that for any other committee that suddenly said it didn't want to? I can't hear you. Uh, would we do that for, for any other committee? I'd just like some advice as to... I mean, I see the principle I have no difficulty with, but let's talk it through as how this is actually happening. Would we normally do this in this manner? There have been uh, other instances where we have just suspended the implementation, to be clear on, on, on facts, uh, that, that, that we're not reversing any decisions here, we're, we're just suspending the implementation. It does appear that uh, mem members may not have uh, c completely understood the facts, and that's no fault of members, and it was no fault of the officers, it was the information that was provided to us at that time, so we want to be absolutely clear that members fully understand uh, the implications. And we do have a procedural error now because that should have been uh, with the Dumfries Common Good Subcommittee to, to get their views on it before it came to PNR. So we're just trying to correct that procedural error as well. Okay, uh, moving on to item four. Sorry. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, at the moment, though, this is just the minute, so this is... The minute is correct. The minute is correct, and uh, Councillor Thompson, the other one, has uh, basically said this needs to be looked at, and you've just explained it, but that's not really... I think I'm sort of sympathising with what Councillor Maitland's saying a wee bit. There is a sort of... It's informative of what Councillor Ted Thompson said, but really, have we just made a decision? No. Or what? We've made a decision to suspend the decision until we get the further information and until we, until we fix the procedural element as well. Uh, leader, is it not to suspend the implementation of the decision? Yeah, suspend the uh, implementation. Uh, yeah. uh, right, until, until we get further information coming back through this, uh, the common good sub back to here. Yes. Yeah. The minute is correct. The minute has been correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh, God, sorry. Um, four. No, moving on now, Jane. I think we've had enough. <laughs> okay. Later then, thank you, Chairman. Okay. Item four, which is local government finance settlement report by head of finance and procurement. This report gives members an overview of the finance settlement for local government for 2017-18, announced by the Scottish Government on the 15th of December 2016. Members will recall that at Phone Council on the 15th of December, we were informed that the settlement would likely mean a further reduction in the resources available to our Council, and that further checking was required before the scale of this could be confirmed. We were also provided with information on the likely impact of a range of reductions. 
Since then, the Scottish Government have published their draft budget and in fact it will be debated today in the Scottish Parliament. The proposal will mean a £327 million reduction in Council's core grants. The Scottish Government have argued that an extra £107 million has been provided for social care within the health budget, but this is ring-fenced for the living wage and new requirements. They have also argued that an extra £120 million has been provided to schools through the attainment fund. However, this funding will go direct to schools, so, can, so neither can be used to offset the £327 million cut in direct council grants. So it's still £327 million. The consequence is set out in paragraph 3.6 of the report, with the confirmation that the settlement, as it currently stands, will see our funding reduced by 4.4% bringing a funding gap in the next financial year to almost £20 million before we take any decisions on council tax. The settlement, as in previous years, also comes with conditions. These are highlighted in the report at paragraphs 3.8 to 3.10. The following report and agenda provides more detail for our consideration on the impact of next year's budget. In his letter to COSLA President David O'Neill on the 15th of December, the Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay demanded that any council not willing to accept the settlement should write to him by 13th of January, although this was later extended to the 20th of January, and that leaders should write. I wrote to Mr Mackay and made clear our council was not in a position to accept or reject any settlement as our budget has not yet been agreed. I also politely pointed out to him that neither has his budget, and in fact, unless he changes his budget, it won't be. The changes may or may not impact on any settlement to our council, and therefore, until he has a budget, and we have a budget, this council is not in a position to accept or reject any of his proposals. And that's what is in the letter. Paul and Julian are here to answer any questions. Members? Jane? Um, I, I've got a couple of questions. If I could just ask the one at uh, 310. Um, it, it's the issue about um, maintaining the pupil-teacher ratio. Um, I mean, we've been told and, and read in the papers and, and seen briefings to say that, um, indeed, not all individual councils have actually maintained that. And um, I'm curious to know um, whether they all signed up to say, yes, we agree with your your your, uh, <laughs> your your suggestion, and then busily did something about their um, their uh, ratios, and the, and was there any sanction? No, there was no sanctions, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware. Uh, um, it's 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 quite a confusing issue because I was at a meeting of COSLA, um and there was an outline of the the. The budget that came through, I can't say an awful lot because it was taken in private. But within that, I did hear that there was no sanctions uh, going to be on the, um, you know, on this proposed draft budget. So there's no sanctions. That's what I heard. I can't go into any more detail than that because it was a private meeting. Paul, do you want to add anything? To that? Just really back up what the leader says, uh, my understanding is there will be no sanctions. And I think that the main reason for that is that the, the ratio was maintained at a national level, and that's the, the requirement that the Scottish Government have. The previous year, when uh, our ratio changed, the ratio had not been maintained at a national level, and therefore the authorities that did have a change in their ratio uh, had defined, and that's what happened to us in that year. Jeff, same point? Just <coughs> as a bit of background. I mean, the minister was asked uh, to take into account the problem with recruiting teachers. We just aren't sufficient teachers there, particularly in their rural areas. I mean, Dumfries and Galloway have been fortunate in terms of uh, being able to uh, maintain our uh, pupil-teacher ratio, but in other rural areas, Fife leaps, leaps to mind. They've got a huge number of vacant posts, which no matter what they try to do, they can't fill because there aren't sufficient teachers there. OK, uh, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Uh, going to page 25 and 24. In plain, simple, easy to understand language that the public will understand, never mind anybody else, the figure 
that's in the last column on page 25 for Dumfries and Galloway says 283.598, which includes an additional funding of 1.635. The question is, did we get that 1.635, therefore our total for the 16-17 will be 283.598. And conversely for page 24, again for plain and easy understanding, the figure that's in the last column is 274966, which is made up of a whole lot of stuff, but there's a ring fencing of 5185. Plain and simple language. Will we get the 5.185 and did we get the 1.635? Yes. So therefore the two totals that are in the last columns in each of the two pages are one the accurate figure for this year's budget and depending on the outcome of today and following the uh, things in the Scottish Parliament would be the figure that we would get next year. Yes. Thanks, Leader. Uh, back to page 13, 3.5. 3 .5. The needs-based formula now, I notice it is based on population, pupil numbers, etc. Does the formula take adequate cognizance of the, er the elderly demographic in the Friesen Galloway? The fact that we have a very large elderly population. Yes, that is taken into account in the formula. That's one of the indicators that are used in terms of the distribution. I think the only thing I would say in relation to that is that the GE, which is used to determine distribution, doesn't fully match the level of spending required. So the distribution formula takes into account relative shares of the elderly population and other uh, groups. However, that doesn't result in necessarily pound-for-pound -pound movements in cash to address that. Are, are you suggesting, Paul, that it doesn't take adequate account? The distribution formula does take appropriate account of the change. Obviously, in terms of whether we have enough funding to address the needs, that's a separate issue. Willie. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, it's really just to hope, uh, or to put forward that I hope the committee will support or, or endorse the action you have taken in terms of the letter that you have written to the Finance Minister in terms that neither have you, you accepted or rejected anything as yet given that there is a debate today and a vote today in the, uh, at Holyrood. And I would hope uh, that uh, the remarks made uh, last week by Anna Sarwar and indeed the remarks made today by Kessia Dugdale that we see uh, the, 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 the Scottish Government then going along with, it, with the remarks and that we may find that they will not reduce the, the, the local government settlement by the 300 and, or 327 that you referred to earlier. I would hope that's the best possible result we could get for this authority and the other 31 authorities, because quite frankly, you know, the report here, enough is enough. Andy. Uh, thanks very much. Two, two points, uh, Leader. One at 3.6, uh, the floor at 4.4%, just, it's a yes, no answer, this really, is that, um, uh, is that decided uh, because of a, a decision made at COSLA that uh, we would be in there and it was the COSLA leaders uh, who voted this through, COSLA voted this through, that's why we're 4.4 rather than the 3 point whatever it should be um, for us. Um, that's the first thing. Um, and the second question, um, I refer to Jeff's remark about teachers, and he's quite right about the, uh, you know, maintaining, you know, it's hard to get teachers um, it's also hard to get people, like, uh, social workers, some other uh, uh, things here. But the question really is, are we looking at the retention of these very, very valuable staff? Right? And what effect does the, the number of staff who are leaving here right, have on the recruitment? Because we haven't really looked at that in any great detail, at least as a committee, I can't recollect that. That work maybe have been going on behind the scenes, but we've had no report back on that. 
because I'm, I'm, I'm taking you back a few years ago that some of the, uh, the longer serving councillors will remember we had the same problem in social work a number of years ago and we worked out if we can retain what we had, then we recruit and then in, uh, uh, looked after the current staff possibly better, right? then the recruitment also improved at the same time. So I, I think it, it, it's a worthwhile exercise and it's a, it's a worthwhile thing that, that Jeff brought forward and we, we need to note that, yes, but it's the reasons why it's difficult for us and to always blame it on rurality right, isn't the only reason we can't get staff. And we need to address that. And we need to address it as a matter of urgency. In terms of the, the operation of the floor, that's something that is agreed jointly between COSLA and the Scottish Government. It uh, continues to be supported by the Settlement and Distribution Group and by, by COSLA leaders, but the level of the floor is determined by the Scottish Government itself. Uh, in terms of the teacher, I, I think probably the question was probably directed elsewhere, although I'm aware that we do have a grow your own policy in the police and government operating to address some of those issues, but I suspect that may be added to by others. Thank you. Colin. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered if somebody could refresh my feeling memory. I remember, or I don't remember very well actually, at education a year or so or more ago that the Something about our pupil teacher ratios were better than the national average, but we were being forced to take on more teachers. There was some kind of anomaly. I just wonder if anyone remembers it and if somebody could maybe refresh what that was about. Thank you. Not just you, Jane. <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the government targets 13.7, the pupil-teacher ratio. I think ours is 12.7, 12.8, so it's well below the, uh, the national average. Um, but because in the past we've actually been fine because our ratio changed slightly on um, the census day, which I think is in uh, October, so we were effectively fined £303,000 uh, last year because... Our teacher number decreased on that particular day from uh, 1,521 to 1,506. So to actually maintain that sort of accuracy, that's a 0.1% change on that one particular day, and we were fined £303,000 for that. So it, 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 it's, it's a policy which doesn't have any uh, rationale behind it at all. It's just an, an, a, a number which has been fixed on by the Scottish Government for whatever reason. As far as we're aware, I haven't been told we can uh, alter it. So... What we need to do is to actually try and maintain that number, and it's costing us an awful lot of money in order to do that, which is diverting resources. Okay, uh, Paul, just on the, just of my clarity here, the, the, um, the couple of questions I was asked, one by Andy, one by Jim, um, uh, the, the five million, that, that doesn't include any pressures or additionality. Can you check what five million you're referring to? The, the, the difference in figures, sorry. The, the five billion, I think, that Councillor McClung was referring to is additional specific grant funding that's being received in relation to the, the schools attainment fund and the criminal justice allocation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think you've, I think you've said the other one that the Scottish government determined. Uh, yeah, the uh, query for Andy. Okay, thanks. Hey, no, be respect, leader. It's it's. It's agreed with Scottish Government after representation from COSLA. That's my understanding. Um, it's a joint thing between COSLA and Scottish Government. It's not Scottish Government. No, the, 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 well, can you just explain that again then? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it is a joint thing. The operation of the floor is agreed between Scottish Government and COSLA leaders. Uh, the level of floor is set by the Scottish Government. The report doesn't say anything about whether the, the operation of the floor is a good or bad thing. It purely explains to members the impact of the floor and the Council's funding allocation. Hello? Yep. Hello. Item 5, which is financial strategy. The report sets out the updated budget position for 2017-18 for consideration in preparing their budget proposals. As members will know, around £10 million of cuts for 2017-18 were identified as part of the 2016-17 budget, although all of these have still to be fully agreed for this year's budget. The Scottish Government have increased council tax in the region by £2.4 million, through the council tax multiplier, and councillors will, if they choose, 
be able to increase it by a further 3%, raising £1.9 million, leaving over £5.5 .5 million of savings, or extra revenue still to be identified to reach the £20 million of cuts imposed by the Scottish Government. This is on top of the £70 million of savings over the past three years, and means that this Council is faced with very difficult choices in the weeks ahead. We have also reminded in the report of the budget timetable and process. Paul and John are here to answer any questions arising from the report. I will open the meeting to members. Jane? Um, okay. Uh, leader, um, I, I am a substitute member of the IJB, so I declare that. Uh, I don't think it's any requirement to leave the... the, uh, <laughs> the um, uh, room, but I would like to know if there is any update on the issue of the 2.4 million. Are we in negotiations? What is happening um, with that 2.4 million? It's a really critical figure. Yeah. I suppose that, you know, that to me that's uh, an issue for each individual group to, to decide what they want out of the IGB and the actual consequences of doing that. Uh, have been, you know, if they want to find out, for, for example, how to take the 2.4, what would be the probable impact, but in the end up, it's IGB that actually make the decision, and we can't influence influence that. The IGB will make a decision on how their budget is, uh, you know, and what steps they've got to take for their savings. There's additional complications with cash savings uh, within that, and what we don't want to be doing is, you know, um, you know, making savings for the, the other parts that we don't have to. But that's up to individual groups to sort of their own budget, I think. It's not actually a one for, for us to determine. May I come back? Um, yes. But as everybody knows, what happens with respect to the IJB um, will have an effect on services which this, this council finds very important, very important. And uh, what I'm really after um, is whether we are in negotiations um, with uh, trying to align what we're ha what's happening. I really want to know whether we are working in partnership with the IJB to attempt to make this process as easy as possible. I mean, what we don't want to go into is having each individual group coming up with proposals which are particularly difficult or particularly easy and don't need to be particularly difficult or particularly easy. It would be much, much more helpful if we were quite clearly working in partnership with our colleagues right across the community planning partnership. I think that, you know, just as I said, Jane, and you will know this, uh, being a member of the, you know, the IGB, that I could say you know, I could say to the IGB, I could say that, right, I'm not going to take something, um, there's £200,000, as long as you don't do that, right? In reality, they could say, that's great, I'll have that £200,000, but in reality, I'm going to take it, because it's my decision, it's the IGB's decision. There will be talks, and I'm not saying, you know, that we, are, we are a partnership, as such, we won't be trying to get the best uh, services, and ultimately, uh, you know, that's services to the public. And it will be each individual group's decision about, you know, what they want to put forward as a saving through the IGB, if any, of the £2.4 million. So it will be their decision and their uh, judgment, if you want, how they carry that out. Members, Andy. Thanks very much. Um, I think other than Ted and I are the only two IGB members here today. Uh, just to be clear, the 2.4 million or whatever it is, is a, if it doesn't go through today, the Scottish Government will have a, a knock-on effect on us as well here, because the 2.4 million that Paul is referring to here is already is in the proposed settlement to the, uh, through the NHS to the IGB. Therefore, we're allowed to recover that amount of money up to that amount of money from uh, our contribution to the IGB. That's my uh, understanding of it. And uh, 
And we had a very, very useful seminar um, on last Thursday afternoon as an IGB and board members there, and that was explained in very, very clearly by Katie Lewis, uh, who I know Paul has been working very closely with um, to get this across. So we need to be sure here. And the other thing, just to, I have to say it, when the five of us are at the IGB, we are not there as Labour, SNP, Conservative or whatever. We are there as representatives of this council. So it is not a party issue and how parties think it should be different in the budget setting process if they don't want to utilise the whole 2.4 million um, leverage that we have. Um, but I would suggest that would be political suicide for anybody not to use that leverage when the Scottish Government are proposing to put that amount of money through a different route to fund exactly what this council um, its contribution is. And we can save that amount of money. So it, I think that clarity uh, needs to be there. And I, I'm going to suggest to you when we actually... Uh, no disrespect to Paul, but we need somebody sometimes here when these finance things about the IGB are, are, are in, who is steeped in the IGB work, because uh, Paul's got a lot more on his plate than just the IGB. Um, so we could make that very, very clear. And uh, I, I think it also would do another thing. It would also show a reporting back process for the finances of the IGB back to this council, either through this committee or to full council leader. A couple of things. We have no authority over the IGB. You're not there as a, a council member. You're there as an IGB member. So, no, no, he didn't say that. No, but anyway, the, you're not. You said you're representative for the council. You're not. You're there as an IGB board member. You will make decisions, and I think I made that plain. You can make a decisions completely contrary to what's in here, what's what's said in here. And as a member of the IGB, you're in, it's, um, you, you can do that. And again, the £2.4 million, that's up to any individual group within the council to decide how much of all of it they want, to, they want to take. And it's up to the IGB to decide you know, how that affects the IGB services within the IGB. It's not up to us to decide that. Um, Graham. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, under 5.5, .5, it says detailed work is currently being progressed with NHS colleagues on this. And given the significance of this issue in terms of overall budget setting, it is planned that a verbal update will be provided at this meeting and then subsequently backed up through provision of associated details to all groups. Now, I was, I was expecting that verbal update to come from Paul, being our finance officer, and uh, he's been suspiciously quiet in this particular situation. Is not. Uh, to be fair, I haven't let him in yet. Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Leader. Yes, uh, when we finalised this report, I hadn't anticipated getting the written advice out to all members in advance of today. That's why I referred to a verbal update. But I think it was Wednesday night that I wrote to all members uh, to give further advice on the approach to considering the level of budget to delegate to the IGB for next year. Just want to make sure all members have got that. Another thing I would add that, that although it is my advice, it has been prepared in consultation with colleagues in, in both the NHS and the IGB. I'm happy to provide members and groups with any further assistance as they require in relation to that. Okay, can we go on, Jim? Yeah, thanks, Leader. Just a couple of questions. Uh, 5.6 in the report it says less previously agreed savings are 9.193 million. Uh, in a previous report at this committee in November, there was a potential shortfall of 1.51 million for the agreed savings of 10.7 million. So I take it we're now uh, actually accepting that it's not a potential shortfall. That 1.51 million isn't going to be attained for the budget that was passed earlier in the year. Uh, second thing, pure, simple terms that the public would understand. In the last uh, item, I asked about the two columns in pages 24 and 25, and I got the answer yes to that. I see Paul smiling. In the public's understanding, that means there's a shortfall of 8.632 million for what we get for the Scottish Government, never mind what the, the, you have to do as an accountant and all the rest of it. Public understanding will be the shortfall is 8.632 because that's what the figures say. 
Uh, yes, in terms of the first question, 919, Councillor McClung is correct. Uh, the November report that we brought to this committee explained to members the deliverability of previously agreed savings, and in that report we informed members that the figure had been reduced from 10.7 to, to 9.193. So that's what we're now reflecting in the, in the budget papers. In terms of the, the, the question in relation to, to the finance settlement, and, and Councillor McClung is right at a very high level in terms of it's an £8.6 million difference between those two figures. But if you look at page 36 of your paper, sorry I'm going back to, to the previous report, but if you look at page 36 of your papers, it's important to get a like-for-like like comparison of last year's settlement and this year's settlement in order to get a fair uh, estimation of the level of funding reduction. There's some things that are in last year's settlement that aren't in this year's, there's some things that are in this year's that, that weren't in last year's, and that table there explains to members the movements and shows that a like-for-like like movement in our grant level is £12.451 million pounds of a reduction. So I hope that explains that for members. Yeah, I fully understand, having had previous uh, communication with Paul, uh, how the £12.451 million has actually arrived at. But I'm saying for the members of the public that look at the papers, the shortfall is £8.6 million, no £12.5 that's all I'm saying. When you look at the figures, that's what the public will look like. They will not understand unless they've got some sort of qualification or they've actually asked a, an accountant how we managed to get 12.451. I, I think, I mean, as it's been previously, it's important to have a like-for-like like comparison to settlement levels. And I think what I'm trying to do in the report is explain to members what the impact is of the movement in the settlement on the level of savings that the council requires to identify. And that's twelve point four five one million pounds. Thank you. Um, can we go to the recommendations? Can we know one, two, and three? Okay. Moving on to item six. Further development capital investment strategy. When we set our uh, 10 year capital investment strategy and three year priority capital programs as part of the overall financial strategy, similar to our revenue budget, we agreed a process of implementation, monitoring, and update would be required. This support provides updates to the agreed strategy reflecting the details of the finance settlement, what the pr project allocation would be for flood protection schemes in Newton, Stewart, and Langham taking account of Scottish Government's grant contributions if members chose to agree those as part of their budget proposals later this month. The Scottish Government draft budget includes no increase in capital for local government this year, which is deeply disappointing given the fact that Scottish Government have received a 10.3% capital increase and additional borrowing powers of £450 million. The repayment to local government of the £150 million removed from the budget in 2016-17 by the Scottish Government as part of the reprofiling has been put back another year. The capital budget may or may not change when the Scottish Government agrees the final budget. This report is simply for information and for noting as we agreed as a council to set the capital budget at the same time as the revenue budget. Paul is here to answer any questions. Will it? Yeah, Chair, and there's reference to on page 54 and indeed page 53 to the Stranraer Waterfront regeneration, where it's factually correct in terms of the EEI committee taking a decision in December to come forward with a report that this say there, June 2017, on the full business case, or cases. We have uh, agreed to put the £80,000 uh, in to look at, the, uh, as you see in page 53, for ground investigation. But going alongside that is the, 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 the East Pier, where it currently runs at some market failure of anything up to £14 million. And it's really just to see if Paul could give some indication as to what the expectation will be of this council in terms of the Stranraer waterfront regeneration, in terms of what the council 
may have to put forward where uh, any discussions I've had with the chief executive uh, uh, have been around but to bring the, 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 the East Pier up to uh, a saleable asset could be in the region of some uh, 40 to 50 million pounds. Uh, and that's before uh, anything is actually put on top of it uh, on the East Pier. And we have got, uh, before the last election, John Swinney as then the finance, uh, the cabinet secretary, given a commitment of some six million, which falls well short of what could be required for the, the essential Stronar waterfront regeneration. Is Paul any indication of figures, uh, notwithstanding that the, the, the full business case is still to have uh, come forward? In terms of the, uh, the council's uh, contribution liability, Thanks, Chip. I think that's uh, obviously a, a really important question, and I think that's part of the detailed work that we're doing at the moment in preparation for that full business case and report to come to the EI committee in the summer. There is significant uncertainty at the minute in terms of the overall cost of the project and overall funding package in terms of Scottish government contributions, other funding sources, amounts already in our capital investment strategy attached to economic development and what other uh, monies the Council may have to put in. What I'm doing in, in this report is basically just making sure that members have this as an awareness in terms of any capital investment decisions we're taking at the minute, what that leaves in terms of funding available to be allocated at a future date. So it's important that members are aware of this potential significant commitment coming forward. But unfortunately, I can't really give you a, kind of, a detailed estimate at this stage of the level of council contribution that might be required. Back in that chair. Appreciating uh, the, the uh, explanation given by Paul there in, in terms of just to make us aware. But, you know, the, the period of June 2017 will be the end of the two-year exclusivity period. Uh, and it feels uh, to the people of Stranraer as the biggest stakeholder that it's just limping along, nothing's happening, nothing's being done. Uh, th th there's no real feedback to elected members or indeed the, the, the public to any significance. Uh, uh, and if there is any way uh, uh, that uh, as the policy and resources, this could be accelerated in terms of the awareness that Paul has just referred to. So that, you know, we're not just waiting until 2017, June 2017 but th there is some indication as to responsibility and liability. Is there any way this can be accelerated? Unfortunately, I can't really give you any further information at this stage. Really, what I'm doing in this report is just ensuring that members are aware of this commitment coming forward when considering their investment decisions. In terms of the, the progress for the project itself, we need to speak to colleagues to get further information on that. I think there's a, you know, to say in the report that will be a full business case and complete funding delivery strategy for it coming forward in June, is it? June, uh, June 1st. Um, thank you. Forgive me. I'm sort of slightly struggling with this. Um, I, I know that this is provided as a kind of explanatory report, um, but have I got this right then that um, we... We, we, we decide the capital budget at the same time as we decide the main budget. Um, but, on the other hand, if the whole thing is going to be laid in front of us only in June, um, I, I have to look at things like, you know, Learning Town and the White Sands project, these big projects that have the potential to grow. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and um, at what stage? Um, well, well, yes, somebody's mentioned the Kukubri Art Gallery, and I'm very happy to point out that this council has capped that, and rightly so, rightly so. It's capped that project and said thus far and no further. But I don't see the same um, approach at the moment being adopted with other projects. And what members don't have is, is, is laid out in front of them here. If we do, if we, if we find ourselves having to add an extra half million, um, for the Dumfries White Sands, what therefore cannot come forward? It's that level of decision making that 
that isn't absolutely crystal clear, I think, for members to take that decision. Um, and um, so through you, Leader, could I possibly ask when we might, um, I suppose, have that level of detail and clear explanation to members to say, look, do you realize that if you do not say um, on some of these projects uh, thus far and no further, you will find yourselves paying for them much on a much further and longer uh, profile and, and higher um, costs on an annual basis, which means you cannot do something else. Unless I've misunderstood, happy to be told that. Yeah, uh, Council of Maitland is absolutely right that we members agree the capital investment strategy at the same time as they, they set the budget. Uh, in terms of the, kind of the other elements, uh, absolutely the Kikubi Art Gallery project is capped, as are the other projects in our capital investment strategy. They have a formally agreed budget by members and that's the level they need to operate at. We have had occasions where we've had to come back to this uh, committee previously to ask for increases because of issues that have arisen, including the Kikubi Art Gallery project, but the level of budget that is in the, the capital investment strategy at the moment for the agreed projects is the level of budget that should not be exceeded. In terms of the, the issue about White Sands from our waterfront to Police Learning Town, uh, I think what I'm trying to say in this report is that these are future investment requirements that members will need to consider. I think what I'm probably saying, perhaps not that subtly in the report, is we shouldn't be spending too much at this stage, we need to leave some flexibility for members to take future decisions when the details of those projects come forward. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Leader. Uh, just looking at the two appendix, which is the capital investment strategy approved at full council, uh, 29th of February 2016, at page 56. And the following one that's been put before us today uh, on page 57. Uh, we are being asked to note uh, further corporate priority projects between 18 and 19 and 24, 25. Well, the budget available will increase from what was agreed at Council in, the, uh, in February to what we're being asked to note here by 11.75 million. Uh, where are we getting this 11.75 million that's going to be going into the corporate the, the corporate priority projects? Uh, and also, as, as regarding the capital settlement, uh, sorry to go back again, Paul, page 32 on the budget stuff that was sent out, it says that the final position of the 1617 capital settlement was 21.35 million and in the page before that it says the capital settlement to be paid in 1718 will be 22.37 uh, are both those figures accurate and if so does that mean we're getting one million pound mere capital this day next financial year than what we're this financial year uh, 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 in terms of the, the first question uh, the reason why we've been able to increase the level of uh, funding available for corporate priority projects is that increase in grant funding that's been received as part of the settlement. The, that increase is, doesn't relate to an increase in the total level of funding being made available to local government. What's actually happened is that funding that was previously in specific grants, uh, mainly for uh, the transfer of management development funding uh, for affordable housing projects, which is previously only allocated to Edinburgh and Glasgow, that's actually come back in. It's no longer being used for that purpose. It's come back in to the general settlement and allocated to, to all councils. And as I've reflected in the report, we get an increase in grant as a result of that, and that's what's reflected in the figures. And that's the reason why we've been able to increase the level of corporate priority project funding in the second appendix that you've referred to. The other point I would make in terms of the corporate priority project funding, what that is is it's funding that is not allocated to date and will be available for members to allocate when the appropriate time. So basically the two figures that I quoted for pages 32 and 31 are accurate and we're getting one, this, this next, next incoming year is, one, is an extra one million pound. 
the, the baseline increase is 585,000 in terms of, it's a bit like the question you asked in revenue, in terms of the unhypothecated like for like comparison, it's a £585,000 benefit that there's other elements in there which make the £1 million difference. But the figures are accurate, yes. Jim. Thanks, Leader. With reference to paragraph 4.6, page 53, having twice witnessed the main shopping street of Newton Stewart flooded within the last five years, I would just like to highlight the urgency of including these two flood protection schemes within the capital investment strategy. It is urgently needed, certainly in the case of Newton Stewart. Just to say, uh, obviously that's a decision for members uh, that you'd be looking to take at the full council in February in terms of the approach on those schemes, but Appendix 2 does reflect those in the programme for members' information at this stage. Graham? Yeah, along, uh, thank you, Leader. It's along the same kind of lines, but um, I see the Newton Stewart Flood Prevention Scheme as a projected spend in $7.85 million. Um, now, we know that there's no nothing projected for this year, there's some for next year, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and for the next sort of four years, up to 2020, 2021. But as we know from the White Sands project, once you go into the public consultation process, these things can uh, slip an odd day, or maybe 10 years now and again. But uh, is that in order? Can we, will those sums, once we go into public consultation, and if they don't like what they see the first time round, then we have to redraw it and spend time bringing it together, bring a, a subsequent scheme, scheme together. Can these figures be pushed along a year or two um, as, as time progresses? Or, or, or does that money have to be spent in those particular years? I think one of the benefits of the, the approach uh, that members have taken in terms of development of the capital investment strategy is that you now look at a 10-year time frame so you can look at projects over that period and we recognise that there is a degree of movement uh, from year to year, and that's something we'll continue to bring members information on in terms of where project timescales are subject to change. Colin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page 56 and 57, I'm sure there's a glaringly obvious explanation, but I can't see it. The, flood, the white sand scheme went from 3293 to 23. 293 on the following page. Just wondering why. And there's nothing allocated in page 56 for 2019-20, but on page 57 there's £14,000 has appeared. Just an explanation, thanks. Yes, uh, apologies, members. Should actually have pointed that out in terms of a, a difference in presentation. What we've previously done in terms of the flood prevention schemes was only reflect the net cost of the project uh, in the capital investment strategy. But, but given the, the, the level of these schemes, in fact, we've got more of them now, I think it's more informative to show both the gross cost and the income that's coming in to support those schemes. So actually, in page 58 of your papers, there's a breakdown of the funding allocations for each of the, the flood prevention projects, the level of Scottish Government funding that's being uh, provided to support those projects and the council's net contribution. So that's a kind of a more realistic comparison. But apologies, I should have pointed that out initially. Okay. Um, we'll be going to the recommendations, but you know, I think in overall, you know, if we'd got our share of the 10.3% capital that the Scottish Government had, and also if they did keep to their promise and pay back the hundred and fifty million pounds, we'd have been a lot better off with the capital. Uh, budget than what we are now, instead of reneging it, and there's no guarantee that it won't renege it next year as well. Can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one, two? We will consider three. Item right, seven. This report provides a summary of forecast expenditure for the Council up to the end of December 2016 and the measures being taken to manage budgets across services. 
It also provides a forecast of year-end general fund balances and funding available to support investment and required savings through the, through the change fund, highlighting the challenges of future levels of funding to support savings in future years. The report also updates on progress on delivery of the agreed savings and officers have continued to highlight the challenges and risks associated with the unprecedented level of cuts we have, have to achieve this year and the potential impact and mitigation of these. All measures are being taken to ensure our budget position is balanced for 2016-17, with any costs in relation to the delivery in 2016-17 agreed savings likely to be offset by the funds built up in the change fund. Paul and Julian are here to answer any questions. Members? Okay, Andy. Thanks, Leader. Uh, I mean, in fact, there's a position of where we are just now in, uh, in this current financial year. The bit I'm kind of interested in here is at 3.15, um, so I'm just trying to see if my reading of this is correct. This year's anti-poverty strategy has been funded from last year, and we haven't touched this year's funding allocation from the budget. Right? <laughs> that beggars belief, I have to say, because it was carried forward from last year to this year. It, my understanding was as it went through the budget, because I think it, even all the budgets said that, that that should be the case, that this was a priority for this council. So how can we be underspent when significant numbers of people are using food banks, food banks are struggling um, to, to make ends meet? Um, there's a number of things in here. So really, I appreciate it's not for you to answer, Paul, because uh, you didn't manage to this entirely, this entirely within your remit, but what have we been doing right, that we underspend on something that is such a high priority in this region? It was, it was one of your flagship policies, Ronnie, you know, and why is it underspent? Because that's what effectively what this is. It's a massive underspend in, amongst the most vulnerable people in our region. This is a figure that we've got uh, anti-poverty Policy, and we are working towards that any perfect policy. It's like that's like you, Andy, saying that you know we've got ten million pounds to spend today, tomorrow. Why have we not spent that ten million pounds? There are procedures in place. I think we've got a new anti-poverty officer uh, that's working through to, to actually deal with the, you know a, a coordinated approach. It's not off the cuff remarks like that, Andy. That's very helpful. Have you got anything to add to that, Paul? The only thing I would say is that I'm, I think I'm right in saying that members received a report on the anti-poverty strategy at the December meeting of full council. I think the anti-poverty officer that Leader referred to had just been appointed at that stage. And one of the issues that's reflected in the report is that a further detail would come forward to members uh, in terms of potential uses of that funding. So I think that, that's something that we brought forward in, in early course. And I think you agreed that, Andy. Actually, the reason I'm asking the question, Ronnie, is because tomorrow at SIPL, we've got some organisations coming forward in commissions, right, where we expect them right, to actually have outcomes and outputs for the money that we give them. Right? We've got this money over there. What are actually the outcomes for the people who are in, in poverty? Right? And get, having a new member of staff isn't an outcome for the people on the, on the breadline or the people who are standing in the queue at the food bank. That's the question I'm asking is, so why have we got an underspend? And why is it taking us a year right, to actually get somebody into, into post? Now, it's a quite reasonable question, and the public are, have a right to know why it's taking so long and how that, that's not been taken forward. Councillor Ferguson, you recall that the, the strategy for the anti poverty strategy was agreed by full council, and there's a six monthly report. And as Paul indicated, there is a, an update was presented um, at last full council. Um, and there was a, quite a debate to that, and Councillor Scobie indeed had raised some uh, concerns about making sure outcomes were achieved and that we could see those things on the ground. Um, members have made decisions about allocation of some of the monies, and those have been brought to full council for decision. Um, and I understand from the team who are been working on this that the uh, groups of people who are experiencing poverty and who are needing our help are informing a number of those investments and they will continue to do so. Um, and so we would expect um, further clarity in the update report that comes forward for members and indeed further investments to be made by, by members in that, that regard. Uh, 
Um, well, I, I just want to, to point out to members um, in, in 3.18, um, as I did at the last, at the budget, um, that, that that kind of rather, uh, rather slippery use of the word budgeted use of the change fund, all that meant was that that was a balancing figure. It hasn't done anything, it's just been produced and used as half a million quid, £462,000 out of the change fund, um, and sits there as another problem that we've got this coming year. Um, and if you add that to what we haven't delivered, the 1.3 million, um, we're starting from a real problem. No, not anything easy. We are starting from um, quite a way back. And so leading on from that, um, I, I really sort of, I suppose, beside myself at the whole business of energy efficiency measures, we, we, we budgeted for 420,000, and we simply haven't made them. 145,000. Um, and, and that strikes me as something which really we should have pushed harder on. I know that all elected members actually want that to happen, and I don't understand why it hasn't been um, more forthcoming, uh, because it struck me as something that should happen. It's good for the world, it's good for our budgets, it's good for staff, there's no issue there, and, and yet what is happening, leader, over these particular savings? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, no. I share the member's disappointment regarding the, the kind of the underperformance in terms of the delivery of these savings. There have there has been delays in bringing schemes forward, but there is progress being made at the minute. I know there is a report coming to tomorrow's meeting of the Tipple Committee on energy efficiency measures for for schools. Uh, but there is a recognition that we do need to do more, and that's something working with the service with at the minute to try and ensure that that level of saving is fully delivered in the new year and also look for other opportunities to contribute to savings requirements uh, for uh, going forward. Okay, Willie. Yeah, Chair, and just to the remarks made by Andy and then Lorna uh, in, in terms of uh, my remarks at the last full council when we did discuss the anti-poverty strategy, anti strategy and I think that it's not a matter of just having a strategy. We need to put outcomes, uh, performance indicators, so that we can see that we are, uh, you know, having an impact on, on what is the, the, perhaps the most vulnerable in our communities. And, and that is only reflected in the food banks and the number of people and children who are using them. I think Colin Grant was to come forward with those uh, outcomes so that we can see we are making a difference uh, with the people out there. But could I uh, refer to pages 66 and 67 of the report, uh, where I have serious concerns about uh, achieving the savings that are identified in this report, and indeed, I have been following the operational efficiency of the kinship care, and that has never moved. The outstanding work is none, uh, and working process have been amended to include a continued review of placements. I have raised issues with the, the, the head of legal services, with, with, with Rona, in terms of the council's kinship carer, carer's policy. Uh, I have written to uh, the Head of Children's Services yesterday, uh, indeed, as to whether we are following the, 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 the policy uh, uh, and asked for the report to come back, because it, I have dealt with a number of cases uh, coming forward where we, uh, it looks like we have not followed the policy and really, from the, the head of legal and indeed the, the monitoring officer's position, I would hope we would be looking at that to see if there is any uh, indication of, of perhaps malpractice in, in the application or the policy. So, so in that respect, I think we are going to have difficulty in, in terms of the pressure on that particular budget that is continually reported as uh, outstanding what none. But I, I will wait on the, the answers to my questions and hopefully 
well, no, hopefully I, I will seek a report on that to go to the service committee. Likewise, on other two aspects of this report, and one is a uh, reference to support and learner service review, and the other part to that in page 67, where it refers to the reduction in mitigation funding for ASL and other educational savings. And only within the last week or so, I met with a number of parents whose who, who, uh, children uh, have learning difficulties. And what was admitted at the particular meeting by a senior official of the Council within Education with responsibility for the delivery of ASL services is that we haven't got it right in terms of the assessed needs uh, and to identify how many hours that individual may need in the absence of, of the uh, proper assessed needs and not identifying, then it is difficult to see whether uh, the service is being delivered and it may be that it's driven by uh, need uh, on the part of the council to find savings when it's unrealistic in terms of the impact that is having on, again, vulnerable children in our community. And I think these are two areas that I would hope that Paul will look at and give some scrutiny to in terms of the service delivery to vulnerable uh, parts of the community perhaps the most vulnerable in our community. I would hope that Paul would do that as an action plan from this meeting. Just to continue to work closely with the, the service managers in the department to, to ensure the appropriate delivery of the agreed measures. Jim. Thanks, Leader. Uh, paragraph 3-4. The under-recovery of planning application fees. Now, this is running at over £400,000, Paul. Could you give us some background as to why there is such a discrepancy? Uh, the under-recovery is due to um, the number of applications that are being received has fallen. Um, as you may recall, over the past few years, this has been an area of difficulty over the um, the last few financial years, and that they're still continuing to experience that at the moment. However, um, as part of the next year's budget, the, the fees or the level of fees that they'll be able to um, apply for building warrants and uh, plan applications is anticipated to increase, and we, we think that that shortfall will be covered by those measures in the next financial year. So this should hopefully be the last year that we should see those difficulties. So it is mainly down to a reduction in the number of applications. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Paragraph 320, page 62. It's identifying uh, a further amount of 259,000 uh, detailed in Appendix 4 that are no longer required to address the original, original identified purposes and can therefore be released to the change fund. And then it goes on and actually outlines in Appendix 4, uh, just some sort of confirmation here. Are we being asked to move these funds to the change fund now, or are we being asked to consider them for the future? Because I have a, a particular problem with a couple of them, those being the community win winter resilience and the removal of funding for their like building. Just, I want to know, are we actually moving it just now, or are we being asked to consider removing it? The, the amounts for the, the community winter resilience and the, um, the EEI reserves are not um, included within the, the area at the moment. Those are highlighted as areas where we're aware that there are areas which aren't fully utilised and which may be um, reviewed at the end of the financial year. Yeah, thanks for that. That's, that kind of sets my mind at rest on that one. Uh, I'm sorry to get back to the anti-poverty strategy again, but uh, it's somewhat disappointing that we seem to be underspent on that one, when next week at our area committee, we have got a food bank coming for area discretionary funding, 
so as they can move premises because the premises they're in at the minute they're having to move out of, yet they're coming to the area committee to make the building that they're going into fit for purpose. Yet there's apparently a million pound in anti-poverty funding. Well, one of the fastest and easiest identifications of poverty are food banks, yet area committee money is being used and no poverty funder. I think that's what area committee grants are for. You know, if you feel there's a need in the area, you use that need in the area. And you know, the anti-poverty strategy is an overall strategy. Uh, you know, it's not just for one committee. And I know you're trying to make politics out of this, but I think it's more important than politics. I think you know you've got to have the the procedures in place. You've got to tackle anti-poverty as a strategic element as well. It's not just picking things up that you think uh, you can make a, a political point on. The area committee has always had that uh, ability to make funding available for that, and quite rightly so. And if you want to do that or you don't want to do that, that is entirely your position. We can go to the recommendations. Can we note one, two, and three? Thank you. We can go to item eight. This report gives a member an overview of the financial performance of corporate services for 2016-17. I'm pleased to note the projected position for the service and the continued efforts of managers and staff to deliver a balanced budget. Lorna is here to deal with any questions. Members? Can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one, two, and three? Antwerp. And four, sorry. If we can go to item nine, which uh, this report gives members information on the progress so far in the Council's capital investment strategy for the current financial year. The Council has agreed to invest nearly £50 million this year alone in local facilities, infrastructure and schools. Even in these times of constraint and difficult decisions on budgets through tight control and focus on our priorities, we are ensuring local people are seeing these key investments happening and reaping the benefits they bring to local communities. This continues to be an important part of our contribution to support our local economy and delivering projects which are integral to our council priorities, supporting local trades and businesses and hundreds of jobs locally. As at the end of September, the Council has spent over £30 million of this year's programme and we forecast this being fully utilised within the financial year. This shows considerable progress in the last few years in the efficient way we invest in, a, in full our capital in crucial projects for the local community and our economy. I am sure I speak on behalf of all members in recording our appreciation for the effective way staff and our partners are delivering projects such as our new schools. Paul is here to answer any questions arising from the report. Members? Jim? Yeah, thanks, Taylor. Sorry to take this down to ward level, but on page 93, public toilet provision, the own programme, it lists a whole lot of toilets that have been done. Uh, there's a project in my ward that is kind of stalled at the minute in uh, Cairn Ryan. And I'm just wanting the assurance that the, that will still be funded when the decision is taken uh, through the public consultation, that the funding will be there for the work to be carried out. Please. Thanks, Lita. Uh, there had previously been an allocation for that specific project. Um, since nothing had progressed, money has been reprioritised elsewhere within the programme. But that's not to say that once the decision uh, has been made on what's required, that that couldn't come back into the, the programme. Clearly, that would have to come uh, within the spending proposals for uh, future years to this committee. It's a specific question on page 106. It concerns the slippage on ICT network infrastructure brackets security. Um, and I'm just curious about what this actually is and what the impact of slippage would be. Um, I, I, I wonder whether this has any sort of effect upon public access to um, Wi-Fi in, in, in public buildings. Um, 
maybe I could have a little bit of explanation on that, please. Leader, um, there, there is slippage on the, the security side of things. That's predominantly down to our firewall infrastructure. Um, it has taken us longer than anticipated to understand what the configurations of those firewalls need to be, um, particularly around the new prevent agenda, which is being raised through education. Um, so there is a delay in procuring those, um, and, and the intention is that we procure them early next year. Um, as far as public Wi-Fi goes, um, the, the security um, issue will not prevent that. Um, it is in train, but it, it's probably three or four months away at the moment. Sean? Yeah, on page 93, it's really just to probably commend the council with regards to the libraries and customer service centre integration. As you can remember, this was a, a budget saving, but in the case of East Riggs, which myself and, and Council Ogilvy went along to, to see the opening of after it was eventually done, um, you know, we were struck by the, you know, the work that's done there and actually uh, from a budget saving, we've actually got an enhanced and additional service in East Riggs. Um, in the present, in the past, there was just the library, but we've actually managed to provide a customer service centre there. And at the same time, it is actually, you know, working with the, the local head teacher in the school is actually provided security or additional security for the school. So it's really just to kind of record thanks for, for that project and, and being completed. Okay, other members? Can we note one and two? Moving on to item 10, this support has members to consider a transfer of the Langham Day Centre and the former library into community ownership for a nominal sum. Members of the Annandale and SDL Area Committee had recommended to us that we support this community transfer. The Council is committed to being inclusive and protecting our most vulnerable. The Community's Director at paragraph 315 also advised that the relevant application has been submitted and assessed by officers and concluded that this is viable and sustainable and that by transfer and ownership, there will be a positive contribution to the well-being of the local community. Louise is here to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I'm happy to move. The, I know the good work that this, that this place does, and I know the plans for the future. I just move the recommendations. Graham? Yeah. Yeah, I have no problem with this particular uh, project, but this is a more generic question. Um, we transfer buildings of all kinds to different groups within the communities. Um, now, that's fine as long as the, as, as the receiving group continues to operate. But as we know, these things can disappear as quick as they appear, or quicker than they appear. Um, and I'm just wondering what happens in general terms once, if we've transferred a building to uh, a, a, a community group of, of any description, and that community group, for whatever reason, disappears. What happens to that building? Does it, does it automatically come back to the council? Um, and who pays the pound to get it back? I think the answer is yes. I don't know about the pound, but please. Um, we try to write in terms and conditions into the disposal to make that happen, but occasionally we can run into issues depending on the specific constitution of the group. So if it was a charitable uh, endeavour, for instance, uh, they might have a constitution which requires them to put anything asset-wise back to another charity. Uh, and the other issue that we occasionally run into as well when finalising disposal terms is on any um, grant funding that that group may be getting. So there can sometimes be restrictions where grant uh, funders won't give them uh, a grant unless they can demonstrate absolute clear title with uh, limited restrictions. But we try as much as we can to put in something in that regard for uh, something to revert back to the council if, if the group doesn't succeed in what it's trying to do. Just quickly, my reason for asking the question is that we've got a community council, and there's a community council in my ward which has been a negotiating or, or discussing anyway transfer of an asset and within three days last week the community council disappeared you know there's four or five re 
key resignations, like Chair of the Vice, Chair of the Treasurer, they all disappeared. And, and that's why I'm asking the question, the Leader. That's fine. Jane? Um, <clears throat> in the past, um, we've put, you know, what we're doing is foregoing 75,000 or something. I, I don't know. If that's the sort of general figure, which is apparently um, in the air, about what we are foregoing. Um, and in the past, we have um, uh, said to a community, yep, you must get it done by a certain time. And we've also actually, interestingly, asked the community to provide us with a business case. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm curious as to why there are sort of differing procedures. Uh, would we have expected to have received some level of business case to show that um, this, this can be dealt with? Um, or is that not normal? And that's just a question. Um, and as I say, um, knowing what's happened in the past, we have we've have put time limits on in the past. Is that reasonable in this case? And the, the group in this instance did work very closely with the communities department and provided them with uh, information in terms of what they were planning to do. And some of that is appended to, uh, to the report. Um, it's entirely um, at the committee's discretion. I would suggest if you wish to put a time limit uh, on it, uh, that would be for you to decide. Pony, you, you said at the start of this that the, the group had been in consult, consultation and their business case and the sustainability all stack up. So why would we want, you know, if you've already examined it and they say, yeah, this this is a goer, I don't know why we're teasing out any further information. Clearly, it, we don't know what's around the corner. Nobody can predict what's going to happen. But at the moment, it seems like it's a viable project. So I'm quite happy with that. I think also in terms of this organisation, it's operated the service from these premises for a good number of years. Um, I think where community organisations have been established to take over um, an asset and, and to, to, to prepare a business plan in that place, this is a functioning organisation which has um, sustained itself over that period of time. So there has been the, the regular due diligence, but it obviously has proved itself in terms of being able to sustain that over a time. So um, while it may appear light of touch, that there has been that kind of engagement through both the health and social care and the communities department around this um, to make sure those things are aligned and they're appropriate. Okay, Gail. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I would just add to that as well, that it has been scrutinised quite carefully by area committee and with, with people who truly understand how the, the business functions there. And I have been out to visit it fairly recently and they've already made significant improvements, which would not have happened had it been under the management of the council. Um, so I think they're doing a cracking job. OK, can we go to the recommendations? Can we note the recommendations with Anna Del Estel and agree to? Thank you. I am 11. The, um, this is Lisa Football Pitcher, White Hills, Loch Maven. The Council is committed to empower communities to make the most of their assets and the talent of the people who live and work in our region. This report asks members to grant a lease for a further 25 years to Loch Maven Amateur Football Club, which will assist the club in accessing funding to develop their facilities. Members of the Annandale and Estale Area Committee had recommended to us that we support this request. Louise Matheson is here to answer any questions arising from the report. Ronnie, first. Then yeah, Gail. I should have said it at the previous one. As, as Gail has mentioned, we, we really went through this with the area committee and, and all the support and information and the local knowledge that Stephen brought. Uh, so I've no compunction at all in, in supporting this one. Because I think if you see the facilities they've got just now, uh, they're not ideal for a football team and this would help them take it forward. Gail? Stephen? Yeah, um, no, I mean, we did we did look at it uh, closely at area committee, but I, I think for the benefit of the rest of this committee, it might be um, helpful to provide a little bit more information on the existing lease for which we're providing an extension. Um, obviously, if it's uh, uh, if it's new and, and this committee can see the sort of full details of that, that's one thing, but at the moment, this is an extension. So for the benefit of the rest of the members of the PNR committee, 
might be helpful to know what the nature of their current lease is so we know what we're actually extending. I don't have that immediately to hand, Chair. Um, we can certainly provide it uh, to the committee members. Okay, can we go? go no, sorry, Jane. I was just going to say if um, Annandale and Estelle Area Committee has been through it with a fine tooth comb, I'm quite happy with that. So it's fine. Okay, can we go to the recommendations? Can we note one, agree two, and three? Item 12, Lisa Pavilion, Beach Grove Tennis Courts, Moffat. Um, the report asked members to grant a lease for the pavilion at Beach Grove Tennis Courts, Moffat, for a, pe for a period of 25 years to Beach Grove Sports Partnership at a rent of a pound per annum. This is to assist the partnership in developing their facilities in line with their aims and support their sustainability and growth. Members of the Annandale and SDLA area committee were being asked to consider this matter at the meeting of 25th of January and I understand they are recommending to us to approve uh, this lease. Members? Okay. Okay. So, Jane, sorry. Well, um, yes. <laughs> but um, where's the supporting evidence to show me um, that this is a priority in terms of our... Um, because there is an impact on the investment on our uh, capital program. Um, and I have to, to simply say, although I think it's probably absolutely the right thing to do, um, I would look at the quantity of money being raised um, by the club um, and say to myself, well, I wonder if they could have actually gone off to get some match funding elsewhere as well. Um, my concern is that although it might be the best idea in the world and it's a good thing to get um, to get uh, you know, big investments and, and substantial investments that actually have an impact, I understand all that, done it, done it ourselves um, in the stewardry, um, this does have an impact upon everybody else's priorities and that's not clear here. I think, you know, the, the monetary side of it and I think it's could we discuss that in the next report? This is this is this touches on all the uh, issues that you are raising there. So if we can agree, twelve. Okay. Moving on to item thirteen. Um, this report seeks a approval of amendments to the land asset class sports pitch capital allocations through to 2018-19 including an allocation to the Beach Grove Tennis Courts, which would seek to match external funding secured by uh, the club. Richard's here to ask, answer any questions arising from the report. Jane, do you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I think in answer to Councillor Maitland's question, the, the percentage of funds that have been secured by the community group um, in terms of the overall project are, are significant. Um, they have been to a number of different funding streams, as you can see in the report. Um, and with our support, I think uh, it would be very difficult and challenging to uh, identify any, anywhere else they could possibly go for any additional funding. I think they've done a, a particularly good job in getting to the, to the level that they have. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the priorities and the realignment uh, as proposed uh, in the report, I've tried to uh, provide some context in terms of the current uh, sports pitch allocation. Uh, we've already uh, moved forward on a number of the projects that were previously agreed. And I think to a large degree, members, that we've, been, we've had a, a, we're almost a victim of our own success in terms of the significant funding we've drawn down in regard to the 3G sports pitches, which have been such a success that we're having to revisit uh, some of the previously agreed uh, capital budget allocations to try and reflect what has been a significantly diminishing uh, reduction in, in, in usage at some of the smaller sites. So um, we're confident that uh, the realignment of the capital as, as uh, proposed is, uh, is the right thing to do, and, uh, and, and we put that before members for, for your uh, consideration and, and hopefully approval. Jeff? 
terms of the uh, the Beach Grove tennis courts in Mufford, the uh, the school at Mufford has two tennis courts and two practice courts, which are available for public hire. How closely are the club and uh, the uh, the school working in terms of the, uh, the provision? I know one's at one end of the uh, the town, the other's at the other. But um, you know, are they working together on this? Uh, yeah, Councillor Lever, the, the answer to that is yes. The club development programme is closely aligned with the PE provision. Um, they're using both facilities in terms of the grassroots development of the sport and then the, the higher end performance um, coaching is, is done through the, uh, uh, through the courts at the, uh, at, at the, at the Beach Grove facility. So yes, the two, the two things are very much aligned. PE staff very much on board working with the club. Sean? Yeah, just notice on 3.4, uh, uh, it's just with regards to what we appear to have, like a, a redundant mugger now because of the uh, the new facilities at, at Lockerbie. Uh, and I know that you are talking to the ward members and the local community uh, to explore whether or not it should be declared surplus. I would say that, you know, if, if, that, if it goes to that, it might be a community group that takes it over, but if it goes to declaring it surplus, I know the land would be worth something, but is there any way that you can salvage some of the like fencing, et cetera, some of the equipment, and that could be reallocated to another facility? I'm, I'm sure uh, happy to work with Louise's team to identify whether there's any um, parts of the current provision that are uh, that remain fit for purpose and can be salvaged for that purpose, definitely. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Leader. June 16, we allocated 75,000 a year for the next three years for the sports pitches. Park School was going to be getting a rejuvenated uh, mugger. That's now, if we accept this, now not going to happen unless it's done through the, the school's capital programme. Uh, if the school's capital programme can't afford it, the school's going to be left with a deteriorating a facility and if we agree with this we are going to have a balance of 26,000 to be spent on sports pitches for the next two years 17, 18 and 18, 19 my reading of the report right? That's correct, yeah If we can do two years for sports pitches 17, 18 and 18, 19 we 30,000 pounds, sorry, 13,000 pounds each. If we can get away with that, why did we allocate 75,000 pounds in June 2016 per year? I think, Chair, what we've, uh, what we've done is we, we've uh, endeavoured to uh, address uh, the issue that's arisen in regard to Beach Grove and, and uh, respond to the community's success in gaining funding uh, in terms of that facility. Um, we had a previously agreed program um, that we were endeavouring to take forward. Uh, as I've mentioned, I think there have been some changes to uh, the, the way that uh, facilities have been used. Park Mugger specifically, as referred to, um, is now, because of the success of the 3G in Stranra, uh, significantly curriculum usage. The rejuvenation of that facility, um, I'm led to believe, is um, not significant in terms of pound, shilling and pence. Uh, I've already spoken to the Director of uh, Children, Young People and Lifelong Learning about that being part of the, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, the education programme. Um, I think it's just a case of uh, endeavouring to be flexible about the resources available to us to reflect um, the need as we move forward, Councillor. Yeah, thanks for letting me back in again, Lena. Uh, fortunately, the mugger at Park School is directly outside the Council offices in Sunrise. And I can tell you for a fact, when there's heavy rain, the pitch is unplayable. It floods. Uh, and what we're being asked to do here is uh, every other sports pitch in Dumfries and Galloway, Walney, have the uh, budget for rejuvenation or work done on it. Uh, if we go ahead with the recommendations here, would that be accurate? The current sports pitch mugger um, maintenance, repairs and maintenance regime is in place across the, across the piece. 
that does require some additional rejuvenation that's formed part of this, this uh, funding profile um, and as detailed, um, particularly in regard to park, um, that we're not suggesting that that doesn't now need to happen. Uh, what we're suggesting is that that will be addressed through the, uh, the school's capital programme. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few observations, mate. The Beach Grove Tennis Courts in Moffat are the responsibility currently of the Council, and it would be incumbent upon the Council to bring the pitches up to the standard that's required, given it's the largest facility in the region. The, the group there have done an, an incredible job of getting some external funding, and I wonder what's the risk if we don't fund it? Did it does all that funding fall, or do they still get that funding and get to do a half-cop job, and we'll have to pick up the pieces later anyway? Um, what's the risk if we don't give them additional funding? Because, as I say, I think they've done a tremendous job of getting the money that they've secured. Um, in answer to the question, uh, Councillor Vergara, the funding will need to be returned um, to the to the uh, um, the, com the organisations that have uh, allocated that funding because it's for the purpose of the full rejuve. Uh, there is no halfway house, so that funding that has been identified will 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 need to be re returned. And the responsibility in terms of the uh, the facility uh, will then fall to the council in terms of whether we a either find the full funding or b require to potentially um, you know close the facility in the future. Um, thanks, uh, Ronnie. Um, I'm just wondering, given the last decision we took just immediately prior to this, um, the tennis club are now able to go to the community when farm benefit company because they now have a secure lease because of the decision. Can I ask uh, Richard, um, was that considered, have you any idea if that was considered by, by the, the, the tennis club? Um, probably they would be disqualified from applying for it because I've been through this process myself and you actually need to show security tenure for the property that you're in. Now they've got that, are they able to go back to the very significant funds in that uh, in that uh, wind farm development thing. Um, so, well, generally very supportive of the whole thing, and I know the history, and I know um, uh, uh, the standing and the status uh, of uh, the, the club, the coach, and everything else that's going on in Moffat. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way we can actually reduce the council's uh, uh, contribution to that, using the community benefit uh, wind farm. Have they tried it, Gail? Um, a couple of things, uh, Councillor Ferguson. The, the previous report referred to the pavilion, the, um, the pavilion is used by three different groups, all of whom have come together to form the, the sports partnership. So the lease pre in the previous report was specific to the pavilion. This is specifically in regard to the tennis courts, and it's, and it's only in regard to the tennis club, whereas the previous one was the, was the, was the joint committee uh, of, all, of all three organisations. Um, so that, that obviously makes things a slightly, slightly more complicated in terms of security of tenure. Can can I say I understand the, the concerns uh, members have expressed, given a significant share of the land asset class that will go to the Beach Cove tennis courts, if we accept these recommendations? There might be an, a, a way through an, an amendment as such. Can I therefore suggest that um, I, I know in the, the report under 3.7 that the operation, upkeep and maintenance of the courts is the responsibility of Dumfries and Galloway Council. However, council officers are working with the Beach Grove Club to establish a, a community sports hub model. I would propose, uh, if, if, you, if you like, uh, that we agree the reprofiling of the Sports Pitches Association, but the funding for the Beach Grove Tennis Court is conditional upon the establishment of a community sports hub, which would reduce the council's liability for the upkeep and maintenance of the courts. And that's clearly uh, uh, the direction the club want to go. It's clearly the way they want to go. Jane. Um, thank you, Leader. If, if I had a list in front of me with the state of muggers and pitches and all the rest of it and could see what was desperately needing to be done um, or wasn't desperately needing to be done, I'd be far happier. Um, about reprofiling, but you know, I just don't have that here. I can't tell. I've no idea. Somebody's mentioned Park School. Um, I know that there's a mugger which floods exactly when there's um, when there's um, wet, 
um, and it, it sits in puddles. So I, I just don't know because I can't tell from this whether I am giving up having that community asset redone within a reasonable time. So, so I'm, I'm rather reluctant, I'm afraid, um, leader, to, to agree to this in its current arrangement because I don't think I can tell whether we are being um, fair to the rest of the um, region. So I'm, I'm inclined to say no. I think I want to put this away until I've received that prioritized um, state of other muggers. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand Councillor Maitland's concern. I, I think that uh, what we're asking here is that the, uh, the, the previously agreed funding profile uh, that identified the areas of most need um, it be amended uh, with the mitigation as discussed in terms of the, the uh, either through the, the school program with Park or uh, the, the need to look at some of these other facilities in the light of developments of 3G pitches and enhanced usage, etc. Um, one of the challenges that we do have is that the, um, the, the awards that have been presented and the clubs have been successful in terms of Beach Grove are time bound. We've already extended the, the closing date for certainly the Sports Scotland Award. Um, Aligned to that, we have the ongoing repairs and maintenance programme with all, all of the multi-use games areas um, and albeit a much reduced um, uh, capital budget, we, have, we do have some resource to endeavour to, to do some of the uh, rejuvenation work uh, that for the most part comes in between five and 7,000 in terms of the, the general um, upkeep uh, and rejuve work for some of these muggers. I think it's about uh, mitigating the risk, uh, Leader, but I do understand Councillor Maitland's concern. Stephen. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, it's just um, just on your suggested uh, amendment, as it were, just for the sake of clarity, given the, um, it may, may be helpful, Richard, if you could maybe update us as to where the, the club are at, given the sort of complexities with the arrangement between the club playing surface, as it were, and what they use and the relationship with the new sports uh, partnership for the pavilion side of things. Obviously, there'd have to be some kind of uh, working with the different entities to establish some kind of relationship in terms of like the maintenance, obviously, which could be a benefit in, in terms of a saving for the council. So um, where are we at with that and how close is the, the actual tennis club to that understanding of, of the responsibility they'll be taking on? Yeah, and I think the relationship and the partnership elements are critical. Um, the the, the three-way partnership, if you like, in regard to the pavilion, um, obviously the interest of the tennis club are very much in regard to um, supporting that as a as a, a pavilion that that is fit for purpose and developed that they that all all user groups the bowl the bowls club the football club and the tennis club can all use. Um, it might be suggested that without then the investment in the courts to go al alongside with that, then there's the the, the, the tennis club. Um, you know uh, that might be a challenging situation to 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 address. What I would say in response to the uh, to the suggestion is that given the very proactive way. The community and the club have gone out to get this to the level of funding they had and the discussions we've had to date with them in regard to that community sports hub model with a management arrangement uh, and responsibilities thereafter i think that the proposal presented will be positively received by the by the by the tennis club okay can we go sorry andy um just a bit of clarification uh, for richard um, if I'm reading this right, this is the work that's been needing to be done to reflect the club's status and stroke profile in UK, um, Scottish-wide, uh, and local tennis world, right? Because it, I think I'm, I'm, I'm picking that up right from uh, people I know in Moffat. Um, and it's... I mean, it, it, I mean, is that the case? I mean, this is... This is if we've got... For example, a club that hosts um, one of the oldest tennis tournaments in the world brings in significant amount of tourism and everything else. Uh, does this work ensure that it's at the required standard for the Lawn Tennis Association and the international world and the whole tennis world to actually hold top class events there? Yes. How many members is actually in that club? 
Uh, my apologies, Leader. Uh, 3.6 of the report gives a, a brief summary of the, the membership at 125 and all of the different coaching qualifications and the, uh, the tournaments that are hosted at the venue. Okay, I'll put a suggestion forward. Is, can, we, can we go with that or do uh, you want to put something else? Sorry? Sorry, Chair. It was just with the absolute clarification that that condition um, of the formation of the sports hub is not going to jeopardise the external funding or the progress of anything. Because I think it sends out the wrong message that a community group has done a cracking job of raising £150,000 for a facility which we own and should be maintaining. Um, and I, I think it sends out entirely the wrong message to community groups that we, if we don't show incredibly willing to support them. Uh, no, Leader, that wouldn't jeopardise the, the external funding. I think it, it would just enhance the direction of travel and, and would be supported by those funding partners, particularly Sports Scotland. Jim? Yeah, it, it was just really to clarify what was said, that the, your amendment suggestion or whatever would be welcomed by the club and it wouldn't have any effect on the outside bodies uh, funding, which I think has been confirmed. Jane? Um, I, I think you've proposed a motion, haven't you, um, Leader? Um, if that is the case, I'd propose an amendment, which is that we delay this until we receive a, um, a comparative list of um, prioritised um, needs for the rest of the region with respect to sports pitches and muggers. Uh, happy to second your amendment. Is there a second? Is there a second for Jane's amendment? Okay. That's fine. So we've, we've, we've agreed to note the update position. Sorry, we're noting the update position and we agree to reprofile the proposed spend of the sports pitch allocation to include beach of tennis courts as detailed in 3.10 of the report, subject to the establishment of a community sports hub and the transfer of responsibility of operation, upkeep and maintenance uh, of the courts to the hub. Thank you. I am 14 uh, of, of no other business, no urgent business. I am 15, Local Government Scotland. Uh, do we agree to adopt the resolution?